Praise the Lord. All right. If you have, uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 6. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to be talking a little bit this morning about uh, communicating with God, prayer, prayer. Recently, Rose and I went to uh, our state's prayer gathering, and, and uh, there's a, an emphasis, and there should be an emphasis, on turning our church into a house of prayer. I hope to think that it, it already is, but uh, prayer is such an important thing. It's communication with God. How many people know that if you are in a relationship with somebody, our relationships are based on how we communicate with one another, isn't it? It's, it's, part, of the human, it's part of the human condition. Um, we need to communicate with one another. We need to be able to talk to one another. We need to be able to share information with one another. And uh, if we don't, you know, because just imagine being in a marriage where there is no speaking or no talking or no communication. I said this before, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be much of a marriage if the only thing I said to my wife was, what's for dinner? That wouldn't be much of a marriage. It wouldn't last too long. It wouldn't be anything for dinner. But uh, it has to be more than that. Sometimes that's the way we treat God. The only time we talk to him is when we say, you know, I need this, I need that, I need that. But we're commanded... And we're, uh, it's important for us to have a communication, an open communication with God. Um, in Matthew chapter 6, which is part of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, okay, Jesus talks about some spiritual disciplines. It's important for Christians. Now, if you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, then it's not important. But if you're, if you're, a, if you're a follower of Christ... Then, then these things are important. And he mentions three things in chapter 6. The first thing he talks about is giving. Three important spiritual disciplines of a believer. And he says this. He says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men, to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father, which is in heaven. Therefore, when you... Do your alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as a hypocrite, the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. What they would do, what the religious leaders of that time would do, would, would be, they would, if they decided they wanted to, if there was a beggar on the street, and they wanted to help the beggar, they would get somebody with a trumpet, and blow up, da 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 and they, they would have somebody announcing, look at this wonderful, magnificent, uh, uh, offering that this, you know, this uh, wonderful uh, Pharisee is giving to this person. And they would make a big deal about it, make a big show. And uh, Jesus says, well, if you do it like that, you know, if that's your motive, then you have your reward. It's, you, got, you got noticed. He says, uh, but when you do alms, let not your left hand know what your right hand does, that your alms may be in secret, and your Father, which sees in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. It's, it's whether you're giving to the poor, whether you're giving to church and so forth. It's, it's your business. It shouldn't be... You know, uh, that's why we don't publish what people give. That's, that's between you and God. And it's something that should be private and should be personal. It's a spiritual discipline. It's very important to do that, but it's, it's private. It's not something that we need to... If, you're, if your agenda or if your purpose of giving alms is to, you know, get people to notice you, well, okay, that's your reward. Don't expect to stand before God someday. And he, he says, you already got your reward. You were doing this to people to see you do it, and they saw you. Okay. Uh, dropping down a little bit, the, the, another spiritual discipline he talks about here. Look at verse 16, and we're going to come back. <laughs> he says this. Moreover, when you fast. Okay. Fast. Now, uh, well, let's read a little bit. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. There's a video we've shown before, and I, I, I didn't dig it up for today, about, it's called The Fast, about a guy that goes to his office, and he's telling everybody, I'm fasting, and he's like, you know, <laughs> you know crying, ah. But it, 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 Jesus said, listen, if you want to fast, it's a spiritual discipline, it's something that we should as believers do. And when you say, what's fasting? That means fasting like no food, okay? People say, well, fasting can be this or that. Well, yeah, you know, okay, but really he's talking about food. 
And if you want to know how to really fast, over in Isaiah, I believe it's chapter uh, 58, they says this is the fast that the Lord has designed. And you can read that about fasting. This isn't a message about fasting. But uh, Jesus says when you fast, uh, a spiritual discipline, something you should do, don't do it so people can see you. If you're just doing it because so, you want to impress people with your spirituality, okay, you'll get your reward. That's all right. He says, but when you fast, in verse 17, anoint your head and wash your face, that you appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which sees in secret, shall reward thee openly. So he's talking about these, these two spiritual disciplines, giving and fasting. He says, when you do this, don't do it so people can see you do it. If somebody sees you accidentally, that's the way it is. But if that's your purpose, that's your motive, you're better off not, not doing it. Okay. But now, the third spiritual discipline I want to deal with this morning, and probably the most important one, is this, back in verse 5. He says, and when you what? Pray. Pray. When you pray. Praying. Now, how many people pray? How many people? You pray? Okay. When Jesus came to this earth and one of the first things he did in his ministry and one of the last things he did was he went into the temple and he cleansed it. How many people know those stories? Yeah, you know, on, and the very, one of the very first things when he began his ministry, he went in there and cast out those people that sold doves and changed money. And right before his crucifixion, when he first, uh, after Palm Sunday, he went into the city and cast out the changers of money. And he said this, he says, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. He didn't say a house of giving. Giving is an important thing. He didn't say, my, my father's house shall be a house of giving. He didn't say, my father's house shall be a house of fasting. It's important to fast. But he did say, my father's house shall be a house of prayer. And that's actually a quotation from the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah. It says, my father's house shall be a house of prayer unto all nations. So it's a place where we pray, where we communicate with God. Okay? Now... Here's a question I would ask you. If Jesus said, my, 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 my father's house shall be a house of prayer, can we say that of our church, my, my, my house, my church is a house of prayer? I would hope so, and I want to encourage even more prayer. We want to plan some, some more prayer things this, this summer, some out, going out and prayer walking and handing out tracts and so forth. But here's a question I would ask you. Can you say, my house is a house of prayer, as an individual, where you, where you live? Your house. Do you pray? Does your family pray? And I don't mean, you know, no, I lay me down to sleep. Because there's another place. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians at the very end. He said this. He, he said, give without ceasing. He didn't say that. He didn't say fast without ceasing. He didn't say it's important we give, important that we fast. He didn't say that. But he said, pray without ceasing. That means, you know... You have to like, constantly be praying. And when I was growing up, prayer was a whole different thing than what it is. I, they taught me prayer was a whole different thing. But praying without ceasing isn't just constantly mouthing words to God. It's constantly being in an attitude of communication with God as believers, as uh, sons and daughters of the Most High. We need to be in constant communication with God. Now listen to what Jesus said. He said, and when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. More, more than likely, the, he's talking about people that pray in public but never pray at home. You know, here at church we have prayer gatherings. We have an intercessory prayer on Thursdays. And um, we have a prayer breakfast, kind of corporate prayer and so forth. And, and people come and we come together and pray. It's good to come to church and pray. But if you're going to pray in church, you ought to be praying at home. Matter of fact, if you're not praying at home, the praying in church really isn't going to, doesn't mean that much. Because just like with the giving and just like with the fasting, if, if you're doing it just so people can see you do it, you might as well not do it. Because God's not, he's not listening. Okay? Now listen to what he says. Here's, here's how we ought to pray. Individually. But you, when you pray, in verse 6, enter into your closet, and when you shut your door, Pray to your Father which is in secret, and your Father which sees in secret shall reward thee openly. Okay? So our main prayer focus, when we pray, this is our personal communication with God, should be between us and Him and nobody else. When I pray, I'm not praying to my wife. I'm not praying to the folks in church. I'm praying, I'm praying to Him. When I come here and we pray corporately, we hear each other pray, that's all right. There's nothing wrong with praying in public. But 
if we're, before we pray in public, we need to have a prayer life at home. We need to spend some time talking to God for ourselves. We need to make that communication time. And again, I go back to my marriage. It'd be one thing if I, you know, if I hug my wife and everybody's looking, and the rest of the time just pretend like she's not there. I shall tell you sometimes she feels like that, but I, I don't do it on purpose. But the thing is, you know, that relationship, our personal relationship has to be established before our, our external one. Listen to what he says. He says, but when you pray... Use not vain repetitions, I get a kick out of this one. Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. I used to think when I first got saved that you had to, you had to pray in Elizabethan English, you know, like the King James, thou, thee, thou, you know. So everybody would say, oh man, that guy can really pray. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, don't be like them. Verse 8, for your father knows what needs, what things you have need of before you ask him. Of this manner, therefore, pray ye. Now, now, he begins what we call the Lord's Prayer. But that, that's a bad name. It's not the Lord's Prayer. It's the sinner's prayer. <laughs> Jesus taught us to pray this prayer, but he didn't have to pray this prayer because he never sinned. He never trespassed against anybody. Okay? But this is the prayer for us. Now, he goes and he gives us this prayer. And here's what, before we look at this prayer, here's what really gets me. He just got done saying, don't use vain repetitions. But when I was growing up, you know what they taught me how to do? They said, it depends on how many sins I committed that week. I said, Our Father, we're on heaven, hell be thy name. I can't come. Our Father, we're on heaven. And say, you know, ten of them, and, and we had to say the Hail Mary, you know, ten of the Hail Mary, full of grace of the Lord. And as a kid, I didn't have a clue what I was saying. You know, I, I thought, now, now, now don't, I hope I don't want to offend anybody, but, you know, they would say like, Hail Mary. I thought they were saying, Hail Mary. <laughs> I just, that's what I thought as a kid. And I said, why are they praying that for? <laughs> you know, that doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, I heard my parents talk like that, but I don't, you know, I don't want to use that word. But, you know, or our Father who art in heaven. That's what I thought they were saying, our Father. Because a kid didn't know, but they, they told us we had to repeat these things. Vain repetition. And how many people today, they'll say, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, we're in heaven, hell be in heaven. And we go through the whole thing. And, and, it, and I think, 90% of the people don't have a clue at what they're saying. So Jesus, first he says, don't use vain repetitions. And what do we go ahead and do? We took the thing, his model prayer, and we took and we turned it into something. We use vain repetitions over and over and over. Our Father. Okay, listen to what he says. He gives us a model prayer. How we ought to pray. How we ought to pray. He says, our Father, if God is not your Father, don't pray to him. The first thing that got to happen is you've got to be born and you've got to be saved. Don't expect to hear anything from God if you're not His. You know, the only, you know what? The only prayer that God hears from a person that ain't saved is a prayer that says, God save me. <laughs> That's the way it is. You know, we may think He hears them, but according to this word, if He's not our Father, the Bible says He hates the workers of iniquity. That's kind of scary. So I thought God loved everyone. He so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son and died on the cross. But if you're not saved, God, the only, the only prayer God's going to hear from you is, save me. Okay? So you've got to make sure first he's your father. He's your heavenly father. Our father, which art in heaven, hallowed, holy be thy name. We worship him, we praise him. This is not a detailed study on this prayer. There's a lot uh, much better that have been done. Uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Are you, do, you want God's, do you really want God's will for your life? When you get your personal prayer life, some of you are going through the Seek God for the City books that we've handed out. And, uh, and you're praying. And all those prayers are about God's will be done in earth. God, you do what you need to do here. He says, listen. Give us this day our daily bread. Just what I need for the day. We say, Lord, give me a big 401k. Lord, give me a good, give me a good, I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a 401k or having a retirement. Don't misunderstand me. But do we really care about just for today? So give us this day our daily bread. This is how Jesus told us to pray. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive. Forgive me and help me forgive others. Okay. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's the prayer. That's like a model prayer that Jesus gave his disciples. It's not the Lord's prayer. It's the sinner's prayer. It's a prayer we've got to pray. 
He didn't have to pray that because he didn't, he, didn't he didn't do anything wrong to anybody. That's for us. See, when we, when we get home and we pray, we don't have to recite that word for word, but it gives us concepts and ideas of how we should communicate with God. And you know what? Communication is a two-way street. When we say, thy will be done, maybe we ought to stop and listen for what his will might be. Amen? You know, we, we, we're always talking to God, telling God, telling God, telling God. But did, did you ever go to God and say, God, I'm seeking your kingdom, and just shut up and wait to listen? You know God will speak to you. God will speak to you. He might speak to you in your heart, still small voice, or he might even use a voice. He does that once in a while. But we've got to listen. Have you ever known anybody... They kept talking and talking and never stopped talking. Now, I, I, I know some folks that you get with them, you're lucky to get in two words. I mean, it's like nonstop. And, and, and you get about 14 times. Well, we get like that with God. We talk to God. We complain to God. And we give him our requests and we cry out to God. And we, oh, God. But do we ever stop? Sometimes God just wants to say, stop for a minute. Let me say something. Listen to what he said. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgotten, give not men their trespasses, neither will your Father. Ooh. Wow. If we want to be forgiven, we need to ask God to help us forgive. I, I want you to turn to another passage with me, which is a similar passage to this. Over there in Luke. Over there in Luke chapter 11. Now, it's, it's very similar. This isn't the same thing because in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, that's a Sermon on the Mount. This is a different time, but it's the same kind of teaching that Jesus did. In Luke chapter 11, it says this. And it came to pass that he was praying in a certain place. When he ceased, one of his disciples came up into him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us how to pray. Teach us to pray. How do we approach God? What do we say, what do, we say to the creator of the universe? Teach us to pray. And he said, when you pray, and he repeated what we call the Lord's Prayer, our Father, which art in heaven, my God, my Father, you are in heaven, your name is holy. Praise and worship the divine. Our prayer should be, we should begin, we should approach God. Even as, as when they approached God in the Old Testament, they had to bring blood and they had to bring all these things. We need to approach God with praise and worship in our heart and in our mouth. Even, even in, the, in the midst of things going on around us where we don't feel like praising Him, when we don't feel like worshiping, when we don't feel good, we ought to praise Him and worship Him. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. God, accomplish on this earth what you will. Your will be done. As in heaven, so in earth. God, what do you want to see happen on this earth? What do you want to see happen on Catalpa Street? What do you want to see happen in New Kensington and Arnold? What is your will for this place? See, when, when we talk about prayer, and again, uh, different kinds of prayer that we have in church, you know, we, we, we have our corporate prayer. We come together for you know, breakfast or sometimes just to pray for leadership, and we pray, and we have intercessory prayer. Brother Jairus has intercessory prayer on Thursday night, which is kind of storming the gates of heaven. But, you know, one thing I, I, I really want to start, I want to start like outreach prayer. I want to start walking the blocks and praying and handing out tracts and praying for God to show us people who need to hear God's word. Praying for God to start breaking the fallow ground that we've been talking about. You know, outreaching prayer. We need to pray because that's God's will. His will, the Bible says, His will is that nobody go to hell. He wants to see everybody get saved. He wants to see Becky Gabor's mom get saved, 104 years old. He wants to see Vicky, uh, uh, Vicky's uh, brother get saved down the floor. He's an atheist. He's dying. He wants to see him get saved. He, wants to, he doesn't want to see anybody go to hell. So when we pray, your will be done in earth as in heaven, his will is that people come to know who he is. And you know who he chose to use to do that? Us. But see, it's one thing. You can go out on the street with a handful of tracks. But if you're not praying, you're just like, you're just going for a walk. 
It's like going out there and praying and seeking God's face and asking him to break hearts and handing out tracts and praying with people and loving people, let the, letting the love of Jesus be shed abroad in our heart. That's, what it's, that's God's will on earth. He says, he goes on and repeats what he said in, in uh, Matthew. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, listen. Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight? Midnight. How many people like to get their door knocked on at midnight? And will go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend, I need some bread. For a friend of mine in, in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Hey, you got any extra loaves of bread in there? I got my friend here, I don't have anything to give him. I can't show him hospitality. And he from within shall answer, listen, I'm in bed, my kids are in bed, it's midnight, go away. I used to live next door to a crack house, okay? You know, people would pound on that door at 4 o'clock in the morning. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> you know, and they'd keep pounding until the door would open, or until I'd call 911, one of the two. They'd, they'd keep pounding, because they want what they want, okay? Midnight. He said, trouble me not, in verse 7, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. You know, if he doesn't shut up, he's eventually going to get up and say, here, take the bread and go home and leave me alone. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. You see, this is, this is in comparison. He's not telling us that we've got to keep bugging God until he does what we want him to do. That's not what he's saying here. But he's saying if, if, a, if a person is going gonna, is gonna to give you your need from your banging on his door, how much will God be willing to answer your prayers? Because this is what he says. I say unto you, ask, and it shall be what? Given you. Ask. Ask. We're, we're, it, we're exhorted in the entire scriptures. If we need something, to ask. James says you have not because you ask not. Or you're, you ask and you ask amiss. You ask because you want to use it for the wrong reason. But he said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and God will open the door. Our Heavenly Father, listen to what he says. For everyone that asks, receive, and he that seeks, finds, and to him that knocks, it shall be opened. That's the promise to the believer. That's the promise to the son and daughter of God, that when we ask him, we think, oh, God's not hearing my prayers. God hears every prayer. He hears every prayer. Sometimes we don't hear the answer, but he hears every prayer. And he says... If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? If your child came to you and said, hey, I'd, I'd like a piece of bread with some jelly on it, would you give him a rock with some jelly on it? Of course not. You wouldn't give him something that would be hurtful to him or deadly to him. He says, or if he ask him a fish, will he give him a serpent? If, you're, if your child came to you and said, hey, you know, Give me a fish stick. You wouldn't give him, you know, a worm. That's not a serpent. Do you get what he's trying to say? What do, we, what do we think about God, our Heavenly Father? Do we think that if we ask him of something, he's going to give us something that's going to be painful or hurtful to us? He says, or if he asks an egg, will he give him... Will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. Do you know how to good, give good gifts to your children? How many of you have kids? You've blessed your kids. How many like to bless their kids? Do you think how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask them? If you ask God for the Holy Spirit, do you think he's going to give you something evil? I'm talking to children of God. Now see, now here's the thing. Here's the thing that we need, we need to 
we need to get in our mind. You know, I've, I've learned as a pastor, I will not talk to somebody that has, that has intoxicated. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Intoxicated? If they're, if, they're, if they're drinking liquor or smoking blunts, I ain't talking to them. I won't talk to people that are distracted. Now, now I've, I've learned this. If I'm, if I'm at home, if you come to my house to visit me, and, uh, you know, and you come in and you say hello, and my TV's on, you know what I do? I turn my TV off. Have you ever gone to visit somebody and you go to talk to them and they're sitting there watching TV and say, yeah, 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 yeah. I won't talk to anybody if they're high or if they're loaded or if they're watching TV, if they're distracted. My grandson sometimes, we see him and he'll have one of them little games, you know. If he's playing that game, I ain't talking to him. So you want to talk to me? Put the game down. We'll talk. How many times do we try to talk to God and we got something else going on? We try to talk to God when we're, you know, when we're just involved in something. Listen, God, God will only talk to you if you're willing to listen. And if you're willing to listen, he'll listen. In fact, he's made some promises about talking to him. We, we spoke a week or so ago about going boldly to the throne of grace. We have the option, something in the Old Testament that they didn't quite, they didn't have that option, but we do because Christ offered his blood once for all. The final sacrifice, no more sacrifice for sins. We can go boldly to the throne of grace. We can go to, directly to the king with our requests through the blood of Jesus Christ. It says, just a couple passages here, we've got, we got a little time. Uh, over in, in a passage we all know in Philippians, let uh, be careful for nothing. Philippians chapter, chapter 4. Some of us know by heart. He says in verse 6, be careful for nothing. Philippians 4 and 6. That means don't worry about anything. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by what? By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. By prayer and thanksgiving and supplication, tell God what your requests are. Have you ever complained to God? Have you ever given a complaint? Now, I think God sometimes will listen to our complaints. And sometimes he doesn't. It's not our complaints. It's our requests. What we need. He says, and this is what will happen. And this is what I want to leave you with this morning as we prepare to go. This is what I want to leave you with. When you pray, believe, expect. Expect this to happen. See, because when, when, I, when I say something to my wife, I expect a response and, and vice versa. If I ask her something, I expect a response. If we go to God, we ought to expect him to do something about our request. Might not always be what we want him to be. But here's what he says. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And what will happen? Here's what will happen. Expect this to happen. And the peace of God. Peace that I can't give you, peace that nobody on this earth can give you. If you go to God, if you go in your closet, if you go home when nobody's looking except Him, and you have a personal conversation with Him where you speak and where you listen and when you say, when you worship Him and expect Him to do things and let your will be done on earth as in heaven, when you do that, you can expect that God will give you peace about whatever you're dealing with. See, I'm, I'm learning that, I'm trying to learn that the hard way. I'm learning that. Because I so often find myself with no peace in my life. Guys, I haven't bothered to be honest with God. I'm a believer. I'm saved. I'm talking to people who are Christians. Be honest with Him. If you know you're, you're messed up in something, be honest with Him. He knows it anyway. He wants to hear you say it. Now, how many times in the scriptures did God ask somebody something that He already knew? 
He's always asking. He asked Adam, Adam, where art thou? He knew where he was. Adam, what did you do? He knew what he did. But he wants to hear us confess. Confess. There's a good scripture. Okay. Over in, in John, 1 John, not, not, not the Gospel of John, but 1 John. Here, here, here look, look, look at this. Look at 1 John chapter 1. Look at this. In verse 8. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, well, I haven't done anything wrong. Huh. What's it say here? We, what? Deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But look at verse 9. If we, what? Confess. You know what that word means? It doesn't mean crawling in a little box and talking to somebody on the other side of the wall. That means saying what God says about it. If we say, yes, God, I'm prideful. Yes, God, I have, I have these habits. Yes, God, I have. If we're, if we're honest with him about what our problems are, here's what it says. And this is what we can expect. He is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess, if we communicate with him, if we go to him and say, listen, I'm doing this and it's wrong and I can't help it. Can you help me? We can expect him. It's expectation. That's part of prayer. We make our requests known. We worship him. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. We ask him to forgive us as we forgive others. And we can expect him to hear and answer our prayers. I want this church to be a house of prayer. I believe it is now. We pray. We have prayer. But I, I, I'd like to see more. I hope and pray that all of you, you come here and we come here and we pray, and that's important. But I hope and pray that all of you, when you go home, you have a place where you get just you and God, where nobody sees and nobody hears and nobody knows but you and Him. And you get with Him and you spend some time quality time with your Creator. And you get that prayer life together. You get that thing going. And you watch what else He can do. You watch, you watch Him. Expect Him. Expect Him to do great things. You know, there have been times I've, I've asked things of God and He hasn't answered them like I have wanted Him to. But He's always let me know He's always let me see why. Why? The Apostle Paul, and I'm closing. He prayed. He said that he had a thorn in his side. Do you know that story? I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Anybody here got a thorn in their side? Could be a person. Could be a, could be a just something. It could be a, a nagging whatever. He said, "God, I'm tired of this thorn in my side. I'm tired of this." The Apostle Paul. Don't feel bad. The Apostle Paul that wrote two thirds of the New Testament. He did the same thing. He prayed. He said, "Lord, take this." thorn out of me. Take his affliction. He said, a messenger from Satan sent to buffet me. Not buffet me, but buffet me. And he said, I besought the Lord not once, not twice, but three times. And you know what God's answer to him was? He said, he said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. You know, you know why Paul had that thorn in his side? He, he tells you over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Because he received such great revelation from God. God didn't want him to get a big head. Huh. That's what he said. He said, I was taken up into the third heaven. I was shown things that I'm not allowed to even speak about. Paul didn't write a book about going to heaven and coming back. <laughs> he wasn't allowed. 
They said, lest I, I be puffed up. I got this messenger from Satan. He got an answer to his prayer. God said, listen, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Paul therefore said, therefore I will greatly rejoice in my afflictions. God has a purpose. He'll tell you your purpose. He'll tell you the reason. He'll tell you why his answer is different from what your desire might be in any given sense. But this is how much I know. Whatever God does is right. And he says, I can come to him at any time with any need. I can come boldly to the throne of grace and expect him to do something. Some of you have been walking around with thorns in your flesh for a long time. I can't give you the answer why it's there. Some of us, and I'll put my hand up, some of us, we stick that thorn in ourselves. And we say, God, can you take this thorn out of my flesh? And God will say, take it out yourself. You put it there. <laughs> he, needs to, he needs to tell us which they are. But I want to encourage you this morning. I wanted to, I wanted to talk about prayer this morning because that's what we need as a body. Our, our nation, we're coming up here in, in early May, there's going to be National Day of Prayer. Every day should be a National Day of Prayer. I mean, we take part in the National Day of Prayer, that's a good thing. But every day should be a National Day of Prayer. That we might be praying for our nation, for our church, for our community. Listen, kids, we'll, we'll, there'll be 50 kids up and down these streets sometimes, up on, on Catalpa Street. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, a thir uh, Thursday night we were coming back from, we were down the light of life when we come back. And man, there was kids everywhere fighting. <laughs> I come out here, I come out here and I look on these steps. Man, I see the rolling blunts. I see the tobacco out there on my, on my church steps. I'm going to put a sign out there. I'm going to say, welcome to God's house. No blunts, no liquor, no gambling. <laughs> you know, on the steps. I seen them doing that one time. They came here and they had cards out. And I said, you guys ain't gambling, are you? He said, oh, it's all right. You can sit there if you want to. All these, you, know what, you know what? We need to bathe this block in prayer. We need to bathe those steps. We need to bathe this community. This, God put us in this neighborhood for a reason. We need to be praying. Brother Jerry said, pray for hearts to be broken. For the fallow ground to be broken up. I pray that our church would be a house of prayer. I pray that each and every house that's represented in this room right now will be a house. I, pray, I, I hope and pray that you will make a determination that my house will be a house of prayer. Your house. That's up to you. I can only do that in my house. Amen? All right. Father, we love you. Father, I thank you that you said in your word we could go boldly to the throne of grace. And we ask you, Lord, that you would help us. You told us in your word that if we ask, we can expect to receive. If we knock, we can expect the door to be open. If we seek, we can expect that we will find what we're looking for. Father, I pray that you will help us be a praying people. Not just when we're here. But when we're in our homes, in our apartments, our houses, help us pray in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We know that you hear and answer prayer. Father, we pray once again for our brother Gary, that you would lay your healing touch upon him, Father, in the name of Jesus.